Hey, everyone. Welcome to Locked on Lakers for Tuesday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky, the player LeBron James made it through practice on Monday without seeming to have any setbacks. But what about GM LeBron James? How much work does he think this roster needs? He talked about that on Monday, and we'll talk about it next on Locked on Lakers. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank everybody for making Locked On Lakers your first listen of every day, Monday through Friday. No matter where you get your podcasts, uh, we have a fresh one up there for you uh, as early as we possibly can, and it's absolutely free. We're never going to charge you for this thing. Uh, we charge them, but we don't charge you. Um, and uh, make another Locked On podcast your second listen, perhaps Locked On Rams with our friend Travis Rogers as he's getting everybody around here ready for the Super Bowl. Um, we will get to LeBron James, GM LeBron James. Of course, Andy, LeBron James is not the GM of the Los Angeles Lakers. Well, certainly not um, this season. No. <laughs> Uh, only when things go well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> LeBron, the GM. Yeah, um, it, it, we we will see. This is one of my favorite things about LeBron. I remember you and I debated this on a recent show. Uh, the idea that LeBron shies away from the idea that he's actively involved with front office moves. He doesn't shy away from it if it's working out great. Yes, I he should have been more. I should have been more specific. We'll talk about that in a second because LeBron was asked about you know the the state of the team, uh, how they look because it is deadline week. The deadline is Thursday, I believe, noon Pacific time. Uh, you got to mm -hmm. have all your trades uh, done, your ducks in a row. Make sure um, you're paying, by the way, attention to the Locked On uh, NBA Network trade show that's going to be going on that day. Yes, absolutely. Um, so. Um, so we, we'll get to that in a second because LeBron was asked directly about it. But first, it, is LeBron on the floor? Because he played um, 39 minutes, I believe it was, against 40. the 40. We're rounding mm -hmm. up <laughs> um, against the Knicks on Saturday. And this was his first game back after the knee injury. Everybody agreed that was probably more than anyone wanted. Um, and on Monday after practice, LeBron said that he doesn't believe he had any setbacks. He thinks he's okay and seemed, Andy, to indicate that he expects to play Tuesday night against Milwaukee in a marquee nationally televised game. Yeah, first of all, those are often the type of games that get LeBron to show up in the first place. But, you know, if if there's any type of doubts, uh, I think the tie goes to how many people will get to watch him. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it sounded to me like LeBron was fairly confident he would be able to play. I think this has been a season that, I mean, really, you could argue LeBron's Unfortunately, the majority of his time with the Lakers, he's learned that there are no promises when it comes to health, uh, his own or teammates. And he talked about how actually he's never been part of a season where injuries have played such a toll. But, you know, he, he acknowledged there's been a lot going on this year that's made it very difficult for the team to assess where they are and, you know, exactly how to do the necessary work. But I, if nothing else, feel confident LeBron's going to be out there today. Yeah, and if he doesn't play, you know, against the Bucks, there's certainly a reasonable chance he comes back and plays Wednesday against Portland in a game. Again, these the the, the Portland game, as we've noted, as these games come up, the Portland game is more important than the Milwaukee game. The Milwaukee game is higher profile. It would certainly be a major confidence booster for the Lakers to win, especially you know the Bucks put up I think 140 points on the Clippers. Uh, Sunday night. I mean, they they just poured it on 130, 140 points, something like that. And uh, given the way the Lakers have struggled on defense, I wouldn't put it past them to do it again. Um, so, you know, the, it would mean a lot for the Lakers to play a good game on Tuesday and even to win that. But Wednesday is the one that really matters because Portland sucks and you can't give away games against bad teams at this point in the season. Um, other housekeeping notes, Carmelo Anthony is not going to play uh, Tuesday night against Milwaukee. Uh, Frank Vogel ruled him out of this one, uh, did not necessarily, though, rule him out of Wednesday's game. I don't know if he'll play or not, but the fact that he isn't being ruled out is a good sign that over the long term, this is probably not a really serious injury. I kind of feel like Portland. That's a game where Mello could be able to half-ass his way through it if everybody else plays hard enough. Like you could split the difference and just let 
mellow play while very mindful of that hamstring and just let everybody else do the work. Uh, Dwight also, it's still uncertain with that back injury that kept him out of Saturday's game against the Knicks, whether he's going to be available to, tonight against Milwaukee as well. And, so we'll and see of course, uh, Kendrick Nunn, uh, it should be noted, was doing a little bit more on the court, uh, but is still a long way from coming back. <laughs> it wasn't special. Does that mean he like just way. walked across it to get from? I was going like, to say. I mean, he might have had like a lemonade stand on the court. Like it really, it was not clarified what he was doing on the court. Just that whatever it was, he was doing more of it. <laughs> right. I mean, more at this, this point, thing. man, I I, I want to hear about anything until he's active on the roster. I mean, like it just. I, no offense to anybody involved, but I, I don't. I, you're, you're taking up my time with busy work. I don't. I don't need to know it. Just let me know when he's playing. Yeah, certainly the idea that Kendrick Nunn is going to give people an impression of whether or not he could help them uh, before they would have to acquire him at the trade deadline. That ship has sailed. Um, <laughs> he, he, is, he is. He will not be doing that. Uh, if you want Kendrick Nunn, it is purely for his contract number and perhaps the prospect of of playing him next year at a five million dollar cap figure. Um, the other thing that happened, we're going to talk a little bit about Russell Westbrook too, because he was the topic of conversation on Monday. He didn't speak to the media, but, uh, people asked a lot of questions about him because Westbrook remains endlessly fascinating uh, beyond being endlessly frustrating. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Russ after Monday's show, Andy, where we had a heated debate about Russell Westbrook. It yes, was we did. I like that. That was, yeah, we got, yeah. you know, people, people were, uh, inter interested in that one and go to the locked on Lakers YouTube page. You can see a lot of great comments from that. So we'll, we'll get back to that in a second. But um, LeBron was asked, I thought, a, a very interesting question in a very interesting way. Um, his, you have a strong partnership with Rob Palenka, the general manager of the Lakers. Um, when you consider that, when you look at the team, do you look at it as a, you know, do you need help? Or do you want to be active and all that kind of stuff? Uh, basically saying, you know, hey, GM LeBron, do you think this team needs to make a trade? Um, and he he deflected, but in a way that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, you know, to get to your point about how LeBron never wants the the blame for bad GMing that goes wrong. Yeah, I mean, he he had said that ultimately, you know, anytime you have the opportunity to make your team better, you should at minimum explore it. But at the same time, you always make the assumption that. Post deadline, the team that you currently have is the one that you'll be, as he put, rocking with. And ultimately, how much they need to do, that is a question that you really should be asking Rob Palinka. I just guarantee that if the Lakers make a trade, whoever they traded for, LeBron has been scouting that guy since like fourth grade. It brings up a really interesting question um, because the Clippers, as we briefly noted on Monday's show, the Clippers made a significant deal over the weekend. They acquired Robert Covington and Norman Powell from Portland um, in exchange for functionally nothing uh, because the big piece going back was Eric Bledsoe, who was not a particularly important piece of that Clippers team. Um, so, and he's on a non-guaranteed deal next year, which right. for all intents and purposes makes him expiring. Basically, I believe everything other than Keon Johnson that the, the, the Blazers got was just expiring it deals. They money. Were it's all deals. money related. And so, yeah. but, you know, the Clippers got better without giving, my biggest point was that the Clippers got better without giving up a piece of significance to do it. Um, and so that's just the first volley in what will likely be a few more teams in the West making deals. So in the light of that trade, Andy, uh, with one of the teams that the Lakers are chasing to try to at least have a better position in the play-in, if not more than that, it brings up a question that is really important. How much should the Lakers be working to try to rescue this team? And what would you do to make it better? Would you make a, a trade for a non-star like a Norman Powell? We'll talk about that kind of stuff next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by TurboTax. People think unusual circumstances mean complicated taxes, but for TurboTax live experts, that's what makes things interesting. We all have unique lives, whether you're invested in crypto for the first time this year, own an up and, uh, own an up and coming small business, or you're just raising rambunctious kids who are just in the middle of everything, upending your life, but you still love them. Luckily, TurboTax Live has experts who can answer your tax questions, walk you through the whole process, or just do your taxes for you from start to finish. Like, you don't have time for that. They're the experts. Go to them. 
They help you get a, every single deduction that you deserve, no matter what your unique situation is. And you can talk to a TurboTax live expert through your phone or computer without ever leaving your house. TurboTax live experts are here to help you however you need. And if you need an extra hand, hand off your taxes to them. They'll do it all for you. TurboTax experts, an interesting life can mean an even greater refund. So visit TurboTax.com to learn more. You do your thing. They got your taxes. Into it, TurboTax Live. Okay, Andy. So there are a couple questions here when you start to consider where the Lakers are as the trade deadline approaches on Thursday. Um, I think by now everybody knows the inventory of things the Lakers have available uh, that they can put forward in a trade. You have Taylor Horton Tucker, who makes about $9 million. You have Kendrick Nunn, who makes about five. You have a draft pick, uh, a first round pick that you can trade in 2027. Um, so a few years from now and flotsam, jetsam, and some second round picks. Not a lot. It, you know, I think if you can acquire Jeremy Grant for that, maybe you consider it. You know, guys who are so are higher end players that it clearly will improve your team and all that kind of stuff. The the harder question is, do you give up that stuff that you can only trade once? You can't t- trade THT twice, you can't use the stuff, and then you go into the summer with almost nothing to I'm be able concerned. to improve the team. I'm concerned you can't trade THT once. <laughs> right, but I'm saying you understand my point though. Like yes. you do it now, you go into the summertime yes. with virtually nothing that you can do yeah, I know. from a trade standpoint to try to improve the roster. Um, would you trade THT, the pick, all that stuff for a non-star, but a perfectly good player like Norman Powell and Robert Covington? Like those are non-stars but would certainly improve the Lakers. And just so people understand, the Lakers financially couldn't have made a trade like that. I'm just asking more about their the the sort of level, the tier of player that these guys represent. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this, Brian, and it's an interesting question in the sense of, like, apply it literally to Norman Powell and Robert Covington for the sake of this question. Sure. Norm Powell is a very good scorer. Mm-hmm. He's a fairly, I think, one-dimensional player, but he's a very well-rounded scorer. He can score from a lot of different places on the court. He is very good in that lane. And Robert Covington is kind of a diminishing three-ish, D-ish type player. He'd be expiring anyway, but the Lakers, if nothing else, could use wing depth. They have pretty much none of it. They he could would use help. A- I mean, I, 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 I think the shine has sort of come. There was a point yeah. at which Robert Covington was sort of a – as particularly like an analytics darling of of the league and thought of maybe as a little better defender than he is um, and all that stuff. But he would still help the Lakers' Ryan, wing rotation, I think, pretty significantly. Ryan, he might be the Lakers' best wing defender now. I don't care how diminished he is. Right. So he would, but, help, well, he would help. Right. But what you have to think about, though, with, with a trade like this along these type of lines is, I think with the Lakers, both the now and the later, like the now – how good do you think this team actually is? Like, how rescuable do you think this team is? Let's just assume that LeBron plays in this next game, stays, or tonight's game stays healthy moving forward. You get Melo back quickly. You get Dwight back quickly. Everybody stays on the court. You've got 20-something games to get this thing together. How likely do you think that is? How rescuable do you think this season is? Because that would dictate the math on whether or not you would do a trade specifically to help rescue this season because you don't want to feel like you're necessarily throwing good money after bad. From there, you have to think about, okay, long-term planning with this team. How does a guy like, say, Norm Powell, who's on a contract that is reasonably priced, it's around 18 to 20-ish per season, depending on the year, but it goes through forever. Yes, it goes through 2026. And remember, after the 2023 season, you get Russ off the books, you get LeBron at least for the time being at his current salary off the books. You get basically everybody other than Anthony Davis and maybe THT, who I believe, I don't remember if it's a player option or team option. I think it's a player option. I think it is. Well, he's a clutch client. It's got to be player. Um But basically those two guys and that's it. So you have a lot of debt clearing ability. And while Norm Powell wouldn't eat it all up, you are still $18 million up. Right. 
do you do you want to commit to Norm Powell in his early 30s moving forward at that clip with Anthony Davis versus having that 18, 19 million earmarked for somebody else, especially when you don't know the state of this team moving forward? And honestly, even not even knowing how often Anthony Davis will be on the court. It just it speaks to the very tenuous place, Brian, that this team is in right now, that this is a very complex thing to try to figure out before you even get into how well would say Norman Powell fit on this team. There are right. questions that go beyond that. Right. And, and and each one of these, you know, sort of there's, you know, the, the hypothetical Norman Powell and the actual Norman Powell that we're talking about here. It, it's just, it's, it's interesting to me because I can see the, the, the sort of the intellectual part of me says, you have to look at the record. You have to look at what the how the fit is. You have to look at this stuff and say, I don't care when everybody's back. I still don't see enough here where, you know, the defense has struggled. The offense has struggled. Um, all of this stuff, like the, the, there is a reality to how this team has played, even when guys have been available because they've been better with Anthony Davis, LeBron James, and Russell Westbrook together on the floor with no DeAndre Jordan and blah, 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 blah. We've gone through all of these numbers. They're, they're, they're better, but they're not dominant. They're not, you know, seven and oh with a, you know, plus 13 point differential, you know, when, when those three guys, it's not dominance. It's just better than it's been. But those games weren't with the Anthony Davis we're seeing now. True. Those games weren't with AD dominating and LeBron dominating the way that he has. Those games weren't with Malik Monk performing in the way that he has over the last month and a half where you know it's been a pretty consistent rise in that way. And damn this team, if they don't just make it compelling enough where you can look at it and say, LeBron at his peak, AD at his peak, that's enough to beat a lot of teams, even teams that have been better than you all season long. Um, and I go back to last year. I think they'd have won that first round series against Phoenix if Anthony Davis doesn't get hurt. And it's hard to say that that wasn't a tire fire bleep show of a season from a continuity standpoint. Um, I liked the supporting cast last year better, but fundamentally that team was still built around LeBron and AD. And so, I mean... I'm not sure I would mortgage the future, but I'm not sure how much those pieces really represent anyway. Like, what well, are you clinging to? I mean, at the risk of sounding totally cynical, whether for the theoretical, metaphorical Norm Powell or whoever else THT and you know the gang are linked to, you have to really ask yourself, am I ever going to do better than this? And, you know, that's a depressing way of thinking about it, given all of the hopes and importance that was attached to THT heading into this season, whether as an actual player or the Lakers best slash only trade chip. But this is where we are. He has not progressed the way they wanted him to this season. So you have to think about it a little bit along those lines of just, and, is this going to be the best offer? And and to your point, Andy, I also think there's a very strong argument that can be made for while we're always paying attention to the top, you know, what's who's the best player they can get? Can they get Miles Turner? Can they get DeMontis Sabonis? Like, you know, Indiana's clearly going to blow stuff up, it looks like, over the course of the week. And whatever, I mean, you go down the line of these really impactful players, you can make a very solid argument that the the most impactful guys would be a package that gets you back some version of Kyle Kuzma and Contavious Caldwell Pope, <laughs> who are you know kind of middle of your rotation guys who play important roles defensively, can be bridges that can make it so Avery Bradley maybe plays a little less, other guys maybe play a little bit less who aren't performing, and so you improve your the, the sort of the core of your rotation, you make your better players better, and you eliminate the need to play some of your lesser guys that might be the best avenue for them to get better um as opposed to trying to integrate a a a an all-star or a near all-star um so more stuff that i'm sure we'll talk about on wednesday show and certainly going into thursday on on deadline day um but next andy let's talk about russell westbrook and also trevor ariza has been reborn at 36 or whatever he is so we'll talk about that next 
Locked on Lakers brought to you by Bet Online. There may be less football being played, but BetOnline.net has way more odds and info for this playoff season from scores, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land. Bet Online is the number one spot for all things NFL betting in 2022. And it's not just football. BetOnline.net's basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC odds coverage is the best in the business. From sports right down to your favorite Vegas casino games, Bet Online is the number one online wagering destination bet online the fastest easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports and play your favorite games bet online where the games start okay so russell westbrook was the conversation uh the topic of conversation at monday's practice he did not russ did not speak to the media on monday um which is not unusual on practice day not everybody talks um uh but he you know people ask a lot of questions about him and um it was interesting to hear LeBron, for example, talk about them being in, in his ear, as AD mentioned um, after Saturday's win. Guys are trying to encourage Westbrook, trying to encourage him to be yourself. Go, as Russ always says, go be Russell Westbrook. Um, because I think what we're learning, Andy, is as much as people may not like the Russell Westbrook experience itself, the sort of Russell, sort of Russell Westbrook experience. The hesitant Russell Westbrook experience is even worse. That guy's terrible. I mean, it's like the expression you can't get half pregnant. I mean, this is who Russell Westbrook is and you have to figure out all the different ways to manage who Westbrook is and the best version of him in, in all different facets, whether that's on the court the best way to use him. And also too, because this has now become twice that it's happened and clearly something that Frank Vogel is comfortable doing moving forward. If he's not playing well, he may not finish games. And that is also, by the way, part of managing the Russell Westbrook experience. But all of these things have to happen with Russell Westbrook being the best version of himself in a way that he's obviously comfortable because uncomfortable Russell Westbrook isn't going to get you anything good. Nothing good comes from Russ going out there totally inside his own head, trying to play in a way that he's neither comfortable with or at this point capable of doing. You just have to bring out the best of him in ways that actually work within the team concept. And whatever ways he's willing to adjust to, because like we talked about in Monday's show, some of this is on Russ to just do the damn things and stop fighting it. Mentally, yeah, to the, whatever. You know, like I said, it's not to rehash the argument to the extent I think he can. I don't know. I I, I just question how he's wired. But, it, you know, that's – this is the th – I think you're exactly right. Like, it's either going to work or it's not. I think it's a great way of putting it. But, like, the thing in the middle is 100% guaranteed to fail. Squished like grape, as Mr. Miyagi told us. That's right. Um, One side of the road or the other. As Yoda might say, do or do not, there is no try. Mm -hmm. um, great teachers. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> so the, 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 the thing about it though, that I think that is related to this conversation is the struggling Russell Westbrook. Um, there is now a template for what to do with that. And that's sit it. Um, and it's not going to happen frequently. It's not going to happen to where Frank Vogel is going to not play Westbrook or not start him, come off the bench or, you know, play 15 minutes a game, but in games where Russ isn't performing offensively and particularly is as bad as he was defensively on Saturday. And I believe that really deeply offended Frank Vogel as a basketball coach and a human being. Um, he's going to sit. And two people who were like, this should have been done 10 games in the season. I would say you can only do it if you wait 40 games, 45 games to pull the trigger. If you do it 10 games in the season, you blow up the year. If you do it now, when there's precedent, when there's cause, when things are as bad as they, you can do it again without it being as big of an issue as it would have been earlier. I was going to say, or just when the year's already blown up. But you know, you understand what I'm getting. No, at. I like, do understand know, what you're saying. I just, like, it's, it's just so there. This will not be the last time that Russell Westbrook is pulled from crunch time minutes, uh, particularly if Monk continues to play really well. Um, if Kendrick Nunn comes back <laughs> um, or, you know, they acquire a guard or whatever it might be, um, whether it's subbing him out offense for defense, all these other things, the, 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 the precedent is now there that 
you know, you can do it. You can win games and Russ is going to kind of have to take it because the performance there is obvious and he hasn't, he's had enough time to work through some of these things that would, that would keep him off the court. And last point uh, before we get to Trevor, um, if like we both suspect Frank Vogel won't be the coach next year, what does he really have to lose? Yes, that is a really good point. Um, and I still think that unless they win a title, and I don't think they're going to win a title, he's not going to be the coach next year. Um, so we'll see how that goes. The next guy can deal with it. Uh, Trevor. <laughs> Trevor Reza. Quite a remarkable turnaround in the last couple of games after being, as we both agreed, kind of unplayable for a stretch. Uh, Vogel sat him down, and when he needed to pull the trigger again because Carmelo Anthony got hurt, suddenly Trevor Ariza looked awesome in the last couple of games. Yeah, and it's an interesting confluence of events. First of all, like you said, Carmelo Anthony hasn't been available with that hamstring injury. Also, too, and I think this helped with, uh, with Trevor Kent Bazemore started getting some minutes, and I say this as somebody who had been lobbying to give Bazemore another chance and thought that, you know, while acknowledging I have not seen what's been going on in practice, that Vogel might have been a little too eager to bury a guy that both you and I heading into the season thought would be a very important part of the rotation. Bazemore has been awful. Like yeah. that, the last game that he played, that dude was just straight up wild. And he became, in a lot of ways, as unplayable, uh, unplayable as Trevor was. Also, and, and this was sort of a, a bit of a happy accident, it seems like the few games that Trevor was taken out of the rotation actually allowed his ankle to heal up a little bit more. Because I got to say, coming out there, since being put back into the rotation, he looks just, forget the results, he just looks physically like a different guy. Out He's there. moving like, much better. Yeah. He looks well, he, and this is all relative because nobody is expecting Trevor Reese to go out and put up, you know, 16 points a game and be a dynamic finisher and all that. But switching defensively, being able to pick up guys, making the right pass, you know, looking comfortable, moving around, like all that stuff. Like he was, you know, kind of expected to be a glue guy in the way that Austin Reeves has turned into a, a, a glue guy, a little bit of a different role, but you understand what I'm getting at. Yeah. And he just couldn't move well enough to do it. But against New York, certainly, uh, you know, the most recent example of it, that Trevor Ariza can make a difference well, for the Lakers. Yeah. That's the guy that they were hoping for since the beginning of the year. It was actually interesting. Trevor started getting um, extended minutes against the Clippers. He played, I think, the entire fourth quarter I of that, Clipper, that is correct. Yeah, uh, of the Clipper game that the Lakers almost won before it got, you know, uh, snatched from them. And then against the Knicks, he played like almost all of the second and fourth quarters and then all of overtime. And there was a part of me that was wondering, and I actually asked Vogel about this, if they were thinking that if they're going to play Trevor at all, assuming they like what they're seeing on the court, that there was a goal of just having him play as much as possible in consecutive minutes because they were concerned that if he sits – the ankle might start stiffening up. And, and Vogel said that that's not anything they've been considering at all, that the medical staff said that once he's been out there, there are no limitations or concerns like that. It may just be that you know the extended minutes combined with the ankle healing up more has just gotten him in more of a rhythm. And, Le and LeBron said that uh, at, during Monday's practice that he thought Trevor just playing more has mm -hmm. helped him get into more of a rhythm. But either way, these, these last couple games – you know, as you mentioned, he's not going to be somebody putting up 15 to 20 a night and playing lockdown defense, but he's been helpful and he's been closer to the guy that had been talked up as a missing piece when he was out covering from ankle surgery. He, he's been legitimately helpful. Yeah, which, of course, guarantees that sometime between now and the end of the week, Trevor Ariza will be hit by an asteroid or something like that based on how <laughs> yeah. this season has gone. Um, all right, so we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll hopefully these are trends that continue. You get a, a new version of Anthony Davis. You get a, a new version of Trevor Ariza. Kendrick Nunn comes back one day. He's an acquisition after the trade deadline. Yeah, you know, you pick up somebody uh, on the buyout market like, Again, you squint, you can see the possibilities of what might be as the Lakers get closer and closer <laughs> to uh, to the trade deadline. Um, it's I I I I think it is not premature at this point to ask for days off for most of June, so you know you'll have the parade day free. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, 
get there and uh, be proactive about it because everyone else is going to can't be the last guy in through the door. Um, so we'll, we'll review the Milwaukee game Tuesday night. We'll get you ready for the Portland game on Wednesday night. And obviously the trade deadline coming on Thursday, uh, Locked on Lakers on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to that again. Thanks to everybody for making Locked on Lakers your first listen of every day. We'll see you on Wednesday.